Good morning and uh, welcome to our morning worship service here at Zion. It's always a joy and pleasure for us to come together and worship the Lord on the day that he has given to us. If you are visiting this morning, uh, a special welcome to you. Uh, We do not believe that you are here by accident. The Lord has providentially ordained that you would be with us in worship this morning and we pray that you would be blessed as we worship the Lord together and hear from his word. Uh, I do have a few announcements. Uh, First of all, tonight is root beer float night. may not be the perfect root beer float weather, but uh, we would encourage all of you to come out tomorrow or tonight for that. Uh, Next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, is the Impact Mystery Menu Dinner. Uh, If you haven't yet purchased the ticket, uh, you can speak to uh, Teresa Andrews to do that, Uh, but that's this coming Saturday night, and that should be a, a really, really fun event. Uh, Also, tomorrow night is prayer meeting at 6.30. I don't think it made the bulletin, but uh, there will be a prayer meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. And then finally, uh, for the youth who are singing with the adult choir, uh, you are asked to meet in front of the church immediately after the service. So as soon as the service is over this morning, uh, any of you young people who are singing with the choir, the adult choir, uh, please meet up here uh, right after the service is over. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we have a moment of silent prayer and we ask the Lord's blessing upon this service and so let's bow together before him. Father, we are so thankful that we have the the health and the freedom to be able to gather like this this morning. Lord, help us not to take the Lord's Day for granted. Help us to see it for the gift that it is. And we pray that we, as we worship you this morning, our hearts and our minds would be engaged and that we would praise you for who you are and all that you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 100 is our call to worship this morning. The psalmist says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Receive now the greeting of our God and King. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing together number 374, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Uh, This is a hymn that that speaks of the, the greatness, the majesty, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll sing stanzas one, five, and six, and let's remain standing as we sing.
If you have your Bibles with you, I would invite you to turn in them to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Uh, Luke is the third book of the New Testament right after uh, the Gospel of Mark. We'll be reading in just a moment uh, verses 39 through 43. But before we do that, um, I want to remind us of what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22 when he was summarizing the law of God. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're all pretty familiar with those words. We've heard them many, many times, but, but just think about that. Think about what God commands us to do. He commands us to love him perfectly. He commands us to love our neighbor selflessly, perfectly. And all of us this morning, we we know that we fall very, very short. And and left to ourselves, we would be very discouraged. We would be hopeless. We would be in despair because none of us have done it. And we come this morning to a passage in the Gospel of Luke that is a, a wonderful reminder of God's grace to sinners like us. And so let me read Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. There is perhaps um, no more profound reminder of God's grace to us than this passage. Jesus had uh, two criminals Pretty bad characters if they're being put to death. It wasn't that they just, you know, shoplifted a Snickers bar. These are, these are two men who had done something very, very serious and they were being put to death for it. And they're crucified next to Jesus and one of them, of course, mocks Jesus. And the other one, at some point, we don't know all the details, but at some point the other criminal recognizes who Jesus is and recognizes that, that he is a helpless sinner who can do nothing to save himself. And, and this is a reminder to us this morning that, that salvation is entirely of God's grace. Sometimes you, you meet people who I call them the uh, yeah, but people. Yeah, but people are people who, when they hear that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, will say, yeah, but... Yeah, but you have to obey. Yeah, but you have to do this. This passage is a reminder to us this morning that uh, this man was throwing himself entirely upon the mercy of Christ. He didn't have time to to be baptized. He didn't have time to join a church. He didn't have time to to do a spiritual gift inventory and figure out what his spiritual gift was. He, He cried out to Christ. And Christ said, today when you die, you will be with me in paradise. Brothers and sisters, I I remind you this morning that there's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to him. The good news is the good news because it contains an amazing truth that Jesus did it all. And we, we rest in him. And that is the message we proclaim. That is the message we find our hope in. It's not what we do. It's, to to borrow the words of the hymn, not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not anything that I do can make me right with God. It's only Christ. And what a wonderful example the thief on the cross is to that. That he found grace and mercy when he called out to Christ. Maybe you're living under the burden of thinking you have to do something. Maybe you've been taught that, yeah, Jesus does his part, but you know, you got to do your part and you got to obey or you're going to not make it. I, I want to tell you this morning that, that that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. 
The, the Bible is abundantly clear that salvation is entirely of God's grace. And, and the call of the gospel is to cry out to him, embrace Christ, and he will save you. He will save you. He will wash away all of your sins. And one day you will be with him for eternity. And so we praise our Savior this morning for his perfect work for us. We're going to sing of that now. On number 340, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We're going to sing stanzas one, two, and five and let's stand as we sing. Father, we come before you this morning and we praise you for who you are. You are almighty, you are eternal, you are infinite, uh, you are the creator and sustainer of all things. And, and Lord, we hear a, a vastly different message in our culture today. We live in a culture, Lord, that uh, has by and large rejected objective truth, rejected the idea that there is one true and living God who rules over all things. All roads are seen to lead to the same place. All religions are seen as valid. Lord, we thank you that you have opened our eyes and our hearts to see and to know and to embrace the truth that, that you are the only God, that there is only one way to you and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we come to you this morning confessing our sin to you. We confess that we have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength this past week. We confess that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We confess that we have been selfish, that we have been idolaters. We confess that we have sinned against you not only in our actions, but also in our words and our thoughts. And Lord, we know that uh, 
apart from your grace, we would all be hopeless before you. We thank you this morning for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so, Lord, we are a humble, thankful people this morning. Whether we were brought up in Christian homes and nurtured and raised in the church or whether we came to know the Lord Jesus later in life, Lord, it is entirely of your grace. Help us, Lord, to praise you. Help us to live our lives in in grateful, thankful obedience to you, not in order to earn your favor, but Lord, again, because you have been so gracious and merciful to us. Father, we thank you this morning for all the blessings we have. We thank you for the blessing of this church. We pray that you would continue to bless the ministry of Zion. Thank you for our elders and our deacons and pray that you would bless their ministries among us. Lord, we pray that uh, all the, uh, the ministries and the programs of this church would bring honor to you. We pray this morning, Lord, for those who are hurting. We pray that you would bring healing to their bodies. We pray especially for Tony Visser, Lord, that you would uh, provide answers for him and for Effie and that you would continue to give them your peace. We pray, Lord, that you would um, again, provide healing to him. For others, Lord, as well, who are, are suffering, that you would be a, a great physician to them. For those who are anxious, for those who are fearful, uh, for those who are uh, battling depression, we pray that you would comfort them. Uh, Father, you are a good God. You are a God who works all things for our good and for your glory. Help us, Lord, to see in the the trials and difficulties of life that, that you are directing all things to their appointed ends and that you will never leave us or forsake us. Father, we pray that as we give this morning, we would give with cheerful hearts. We pray for the ministry of Ripon Christian that you would continue to bless that school We pray for the the school board, Lord, that you would give them wisdom. We pray for the the faculty, the teachers, the administration. Father, thank you for them and for their work and and pray that you would uh, continue, Lord, to uh, provide a a Christ-centered education here in Ripon. Pray for all the students, Lord, as they uh, wind down the school year that, that you will bless them in their studies and pray that you will continue to grow them in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we open your word this morning. Help us to, again, be reminded of of all that you have done for us and pray that you would impress your word uh, deep upon our hearts and our minds this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now give to Ripon Christian Tuition Relief, and that offering will now be taken.
Thank you, Joanne. We're going to sing uh, number 172, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. We'll sing stanzas one, two, and three, and let's stand as we sing. Please take your Bibles and turn this morning to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18. Uh, We'll be reading verses 18 through 30. One of you suggested the rich young ruler as one of our favorite Bible stories, and so we're going to look at that together this morning, Luke chapter 18, uh, beginning at verse 18. Luke 18, verse 18. And a ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life.
God has um, opened our eyes as Christians to see that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And he has also opened our eyes to understand that, that all people will spend eternity in one of those two places. And we know that those who place their faith in Christ, those who trust him alone as their savior, will spend eternity with him. And so naturally, our desire is that people would come to know Jesus. Our our desire is that people would be rescued from hell and brought into heaven. Our desire is that people would be brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Our desire as Christians is that people would come to know the the joy that we know, the the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven, the joy of knowing that we have peace with God, the joy of knowing that that we have eternal life. That is our desire as Christians. Unfortunately, though, there are times, if, if you're like me, that you know you should share the gospel with someone, but you don't. There are those perfect opportunities when when God orchestrates it and and opens a door and puts someone in your life and they don't know Jesus and you have the opportunity to share with them, but but you don't. We've all done it, probably. Maybe we don't know what to say. Maybe we fear rejection. Uh, Maybe we worry that we're going to say the wrong thing and so we say nothing. But what if that unbelieving friend or family member or coworker or classmate What if they walked up to you one day or they texted you or they called you and they said, um, hey, can you tell me how I can go to heaven when I die? And wouldn't you be thrilled for that opportunity? You didn't want to maybe say something before, but, but God has now opened this door and they're asking you, what do I need to do to go to heaven when I die? And you would say, God, thank you for opening that door for me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to to tell my friend or my family member or this person at work or school about Jesus. That's the kind of question, children, that gets asked here in this passage. And Jesus is going to answer that question. There's, There's three parts to this passage this morning. Number one is the question. Number two is the answer. And number three is the impossibility. The question, the answer, and the impossibility. This guy comes up to Jesus and he he asks Jesus a very simple question. At least it seems simple on the surface. Good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Now who is this guy and and what do we know about him? Well, when we we take the, the various passages from the other gospels, we take Matthew and Mark and Luke, all three of the gospels, talk about this man. When we put all three Gospels side by side, we we learn four things about this guy. Number one, it's obvious he has no problem coming to Jesus and asking Jesus a question. There's some people who intimidate us, right? And we're intimidated to where we don't we don't want to ask a question. We might feel like we're being stupid. But this guy has no problem coming to Jesus with his question. And and one of the things that that characterized the earthly ministry of Jesus was his care and his compassion for other people. You, You can't read the Gospels without seeing Jesus really cared about people. Now, now certainly Jesus was was very pointed toward the self righteous. He had no problem calling out pride and, and legalism in people. In, in fact, there's a point in, in Matthew's gospel when, when Jesus tells his disciples, don't waste your time with the self-righteous. Be done with them. But for people who are hurting, people who are downtrodden, people who are struggling, for, for people asking legitimate questions, Jesus showed immense concern And so this man knows he can come to Jesus. He he sees Jesus as this authoritative teacher who will answer the difficult questions of life. Second, we also know that this guy is wealthy. Matthew's gospel tells us that this man had great possessions. Third, Matthew also tells us that this man is young. 
And, and this probably tells us something about his wealth. The reason he's wealthy is not because he's worked really hard for 50 years. The reason he's wealthy is he's inherited his wealth from his family. And then fourth, Luke tells us here that he's a ruler. Children, what that means is he probably holds some kind of um, important position in a local synagogue, place of worship. So you put all of this together and this is why this man has come to be known as the rich, young ruler. This is a prominent man. Uh, This is a wealthy man. This is an important man in the community. This is probably a man who's very, very well known. And he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus this question, Jesus, what do I have to do to have eternal life? Now on the surface, we, we say that's a great question. I mean, it's great, right, when, when people say, how can I go to heaven? We love that question. But, but when we examine the question a little bit more carefully, we, we notice something here. This man has the mindset that he has to do something. He has to do something. This man's thinking is that he has to earn his way to heaven. This, by the way, was a very common way of thinking in that day. If you you wanted to go to heaven, you needed to do something. You you needed to to contribute something. One example of of this kind of thinking is the Apostle Paul. Paul, before he was Paul, he was known as Saul. And, And Saul thought that he had to do something to get to heaven. In fact, if you have your Bible, take your Bible for just a moment and go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Before God converted Paul, he was just like the rich young ruler, thinking that he needed to do something to go to heaven. Philippians chapter 3, notice verse 4. He's talking about his pre-Christ life. He says, Philippians 3, 4, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And, And notice his resume. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, I thought I was doing it. I thought I was getting there on my own. I thought I had a sufficient level of righteousness to get to heaven. Now if you look at verse 7, you see that God brought Paul to the place where he realized his good works were nothing. Notice what, he, what Paul writes. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And I'll tell you, this is the point that all of us have to come to. We have to all come to this same point like Paul. We give up on ourselves. We we give up on our own efforts to earn God's favor. We realize that our righteousness is is nothing but filthy rags before God. Our righteousness is nothing but rubbish. Our righteousness is nothing but dung. And we embrace Christ and we find in him alone our righteousness before God. But the point is that this way of thinking, what can I do to inherit eternal life, was very common in that day. It continues to be common in our own day. You you know people, you interact with people who think this same way. In fact, in a recent survey, three quarters of the American public, 75% of the American public agrees with this statement, an individual must contribute his or her own effort to salvation. An individual must contribute his or her own effort to salvation. 75% of the American public agrees with that. That's exactly the way that the rich young ruler thought. 
And the fact of the matter is that, that our world is full of rich young rulers. There are rich young rulers in your neighborhood. There are rich young rulers at your work. There are rich young rulers in your school. There may be rich young rulers in your family. There may be rich young rulers sitting here this morning thinking that you have to contribute something to get to heaven. Now, now certainly we, we commend this man for caring about his soul. Well, a lot of people don't care. A lot of people, it's just, you know, eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die, let's live it up, this life is it. A lot of people think that way. But this man, at least, he cares about his soul. He understands that there is an eternity awaiting him. He's young, but he cares about eternity. Not all young people do. He's rich, but he cares about eternity. Not all rich people do. And that's wonderful. But, but in a very real sense, isn't he asking the wrong question? But, but for now, let, let's say that someone tomorrow comes up to you. And they walk up to you and they say, hey, I know you're a Christian. I know you go to church. Um, what do I need to do to go to heaven when I die? Now, how would you answer them? What would you say to them? Well, that brings us to the answer. The first thing that, that Jesus says to this man is found in verse 19 of Luke 18. He says, um, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That used to strike me as a very strange way to answer that question. It may be even a little harsh, right? Guy comes up to you with this legitimate concern about his spiritual well-being, his eternity, and, and, he, and Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? See, he's trying, to, he's trying to get this man to understand who Jesus is. And, and he says to this, to this man, because he wants to confront this man with the reality of who God is. He, he wants this man to understand the perfect holiness and righteousness of God. Last Sunday morning, we, we looked at Isaiah 6, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Jesus wants this young man to understand the righteousness of God. And he wants this young man to understand that, that if this young man expects to get to heaven by doing something, the standard is perfection. It's not just that you have to be a little bit better than the person next to you. It's like that old joke when you um, are in the mountains hiking and you say, um, you know, what, what are we going to do if we come across a bear? And you say to your friend, well, I don't really have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you. Because the bear is going to get you if I can outrun you. Some people think that in, in regards to salvation. I, I only have to be better than this group of people. Well, God doesn't grade on a curve. The, the standard is perfection. Nothing less than perfection will do. Jesus wants this young man to understand that he's not truly good. He doesn't measure up. That only God is perfect. He wants this young man to understand this so that he will cry out to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But then Jesus adds more. Notice verse 20. He says, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. In other words, you know, you're a, you're a ruler in the synagogue. You know your Bible. Most of you sitting here this morning, you know your Bible. You know what God says. Jesus says, look, if you want to have eternal life, you need to obey God. You need to obey his commandments. Notice that Jesus gives this man commandments 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 of the Ten Commandments. In, in Matthew's account, he also gives him um, the, the second commandment in the summary of the law, you shall love your neighbors yourself. And so Jesus says to this man, look, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you need to keep these six commandments. Now we have to admit that if someone came up to us and they asked us, what can I do to go to heaven when I die? Most of us probably would not respond by saying, here are six commandments. Do them 
and you'll go to heaven when you die. But that's what Jesus does. Isn't that crazy, children? Why would Jesus do that? We'll get to that in a moment, but, but notice that the young man is not at all deterred by this. He, he doesn't go, oh, never mind, I'm going to go ask somebody else. I'm going to get a better answer from someone else. He, he says, I've kept all of these from my youth. When he says my youth, he's talking about the time from the age of 12. See, when a, when a Jewish boy turned 12, he became responsible for living according to the law of God when you were 12 years old and older. And so basically, he's, he's saying to Jesus, ever since the time I've been expected to obey God's commands, I've done it. Ever since I was 12 years old, I've kept his commandments. Now we chuckle at this. Yeah, right, buddy, you've done it. Sure you have. But the fact of the matter is he, you know, he sees himself as a, as a pretty outwardly moral person. He's never killed anyone. He's never slept with someone's wife. He's never taken something that doesn't belong to him. He's a man of his word. He honors his parents. He shows kindness to other people. We probably know people like this. People who, at least on the outside, are very moral We'd, we'd probably like having next-door neighbors like this. They're good people, relatively speaking. Now, what's Jesus going to do with this guy? This rich young ruler thinks he's pretty good. He's got it all together. Ever since I was young, I've kept all these commandments. I've been doing this since I was 12, Jesus. His problem, though, is that he only views God's commandments from an outward perspective. He, he never talks about his heart. He doesn't see the depravity of his heart. Mark tells us in his account, Mark tells us something very interesting. Right after, right after this guy says, I've kept all of these commandments from my youth, Mark writes this, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. In other words, Jesus has compassion, doesn't he, for those who are trapped in self-righteous deception. Jesus, the friend of sinners, has a love, a care, a concern for those who think they can earn their way to heaven. That's a, that's a reminder of the kind of heart that we should have for lost people. Rather than looking down our noses at them, rather than thinking, you know, how foolish can you be? You, you really think you're going to get to heaven by your own works? That's dumb. Rather than thinking those things and, and rather than treating them with contempt, we pray that the Lord would give us a love for lost people. We pray that the Lord would help us this morning and, and all of our lives to see that but for God's grace, we, we would all be on that same path. We're, we're not here this morning because we're better than other people. We don't embrace Jesus because we're smarter or more moral or we got it more together. So we pray that the Lord would give us this kind of love. For that family member or that friend or that person at work or school, that person you see at the store every week, that God would give us a love for them. Well, Jesus is going to tell this man one more thing. Notice verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus is going after this man's God. This man's God was his possessions, his stuff. What he cared about the most were his possessions. What he loved the most were his possessions. 
And so Jesus says to the man, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now, a lot of people misunderstand Jesus. Jesus is not saying, if you do these things, you will go to heaven when you die. He's not saying one path to heaven is to liquidate all that you have. Sell your house, sell your car, sell all your stuff, give away all your money, follow Jesus, and you'll go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying. You could do all of those things and you could still die in your sins. You could sell your house this week and liquidate everything you have and still die in your sins. Why does Jesus say this? Jesus knows this man's heart perfectly. I mean, over and over, the the gospel tells us, we're going to see this again tonight, that that Jesus knows hearts. He he knows what people are thinking. He he knows their motives. He he knows everything. And and here, Jesus knows that, that the one thing this man can't do The one thing this man won't do is give up his possessions. Children, you might remember, I think it was last Sunday morning, I reminded reminded us that the Ten Commandments can be divided into two parts. There's there's our duty to God, Commandments 1, 2, 3, and 4, and there's our duty to our neighbor, Commandments 5 through 10. Well, did you notice that that back in verse 20, when Jesus lists, lists several commandments, He lists all of the commandments that have to do with our duty to our neighbor except for one. He lists five, six, seven, eight, and nine. But he doesn't list the tenth commandment. He doesn't say, you shall not covet. Jesus waited for this. He he waited until after this man said, Oh, Jesus, I've kept all of the commandments that you just listed. I've done all of that. And then Jesus, the the master evangelist, who knows the hearts of people perfectly, unlike us, he goes right for the heart of the matter. He puts his finger right on this man's covetousness, right on his materialism, right on his true God, which are his possessions. And unfortunately, a lot of people misunderstand what what Jesus is getting at here. I I read a commentary, for the most part, a pretty good commentary, where the commentator basically said, um, Jesus tells this man to sell all of his possessions and to follow Jesus to see if this man is really serious about being a Christian. The the basic idea in this commentary was that you, you can't really be a Christian if you aren't serious. The the author writes this. He says, the real issue Jesus presented was, will you do what I ask no matter what? Now, I'm sorry, but, but if that's the attitude that I must have to be a follower of Jesus, I'm in big trouble. Are you always willing to do what Jesus asks you to do no matter what? Jesus doesn't go through all of this to to see how serious this man is. Jesus does this in order to crush this man. Jesus does this to to destroy this man's self-righteousness. He's saying this in order to to cause this man to see his sin, to, to see how utterly hopeless he is before God. You see, Jesus wants this man to come to the point where he stops asking, what must I do? But instead asks, is there any hope for a sinner like me? That's the point that that Jesus is seeking to bring this man to. And it's a point that, that everyone in this room has to come to at some point in your life. Have you come to that place? Have you come to the place where you're, you're not asking, what must I do to go to heaven, but you're asking instead, is there any hope for a sinner like me? 
I'm not asking if you attend church on a regular basis, even though that's a good thing. I'm not asking if you are active in the church, even though that's a good thing. I'm not asking you if you read your Bible and pray regularly, even though those are good things. I'm not asking you if you're serious about your faith, even though that's a good thing. But none of those things will save you. Your church membership, your church attendance, your Bible reading, your prayer, your activity in the church will not save you. I'm asking you this morning if you have seen your helpless condition before God, if you've seen that you can do nothing to earn his favor, and if you've cried out to God for mercy through Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you if you keep looking inside of yourself. I'm not asking you if you keep asking yourself, have I done enough? Have I been good enough? Of course you haven't, neither have I. That's not the question. The question is this, are you looking away from yourself to the only one who can save you? And that is Jesus Christ. It's sad, this man, he doesn't see his sin. We, we don't know what happens to the rich young ruler ultimately, but at this point, he doesn't see his dreadful, hopeless condition before God. And it pains us, right, when we see people like that, when people have heard the truth and been presented with the gospel, maybe even raised in Christian homes, and they don't see it. This man doesn't see it, and verse 23 tells us, when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. He preferred to rely on his own efforts to get to heaven. And he couldn't see the grip that sin had on him. And now we see the impossibility. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says to them in verse 24, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Camels and needles. Children, you've seen camels before. Maybe you've seen them in person or at least on TV or in books. And, and you know, camels are really big. Camels are not little tiny, you know, chihuahuas. Camels are a big creature. Camels are, are typically about... Um, 10 to 11 feet long and about 6 feet high so almost as tall as me they weigh about 1,000 pounds so, so just in your mind picture, picture up here this big giant camel 6 feet long 11 feet, or, or 11 feet long 6 feet tall 1,000 pound camel up here on the stage and children you know what a needle is right? little tiny needle at the very top of a needle, there's what they call an eye, which is the little, uh, little tiny opening where you put the thread. Now, children, if I were to ask one of you this morning to come up here, and let's say I had a, we've got an imaginary needle and we've got an imaginary camel, and I had you, maybe, maybe a couple of you volunteer, come up here, and I want you to take this camel, and I want you to stuff him through the eye of the needle. Now, unless you're going to chop up the camel into many, many, many tiny pieces, you're not going to be able to fit that camel through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. It can't be done. Jesus says it's easier to do that than for a rich person to enter heaven. And, and, and the reality is that Jesus isn't only talking about rich people here. The, the point is that, that those who believe they are self-sufficient, those who believe that they have what it takes to get to heaven, those who think they can earn their way to God, Jesus says, uh-uh, it's not possible. You're more likely to take the camel and stick it through the eye of a needle than for a person depending on their own works and own effort to get to heaven. And the disciples, they, they know the question to ask. They say, well, then who can be saved? What hope is there for any of us? And, and that's true. If, if, if heaven is dependent on what we do, none of us have what it takes. None of us can do it. 
And you can imagine the shoulders of the disciples just drooping at that point. What, what hope is there? It's hopeless. But, but the good news, Jesus proclaims, verse 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. With us, salvation is impossible. It's 100% impossible. Children from a young age, I, I, I pray, really pray that you understand this, that there's no way you can get to heaven on your own. The Bible says that by nature we are spiritually dead, we are slaves of sin, we are children of wrath. There's nothing we can do to change our condition. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're somewhere in the middle, doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your profession, doesn't matter your family tree. None of that stuff matters. None of that stuff will get you to heaven. We can do nothing to save ourselves. We can do nothing to get out from under our hopeless condition. But the wonderful truth of the gospel is that what is impossible with us is possible with God. And that's because God has provided a savior. Children, you've heard all throughout your lives in this church, in your home, maybe in your school, you've heard it over and over and over that Jesus came to this earth and he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He lived the perfect life. He died the curse of death. He rose victorious over the grave. He earned the perfect righteousness we need to stand before God. And when you believe in him, when you place your trust in him, when you embrace him as Lord and Savior, your sins are forgiven. You are credited with the perfect righteousness that God demands. And you are given eternal life. This man failed to see the severity of his sin. And he failed to understand the beauty of the gospel. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton lived a very, very wicked life before he came to know Christ. He was, in a sense, the opposite of the rich young ruler. Rich young ruler... On the outside, he looked like he had it all together. John Newton was a bad dude. But God brought John Newton to the place where he understood his sin. And he understood that only Jesus could save him. And when John Newton was on his deathbed, some of the last words he said, some of his most famous words, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. Brothers and sisters, that is the truth, isn't it? Before you stands a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. The rich young ruler, at least at this point, didn't see it. By God's grace, we have seen it. And we praise him for opening our eyes and we love him because he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this um, very instructive passage that shows us, in a sense, Jesus' method of evangelism. To, to bring a person to the point where they see their sin and they see their hopeless condition and all they can do is cry out to you for mercy. Lord, we pray, first of all, that, that if you give us opportunities to tell the good news to others, that, that you would help us, Lord, to speak the truth, to speak of the, the reality of sin and your holiness and righteousness. And we pray that we would also speak the beautiful truth of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the good news that you have opened our eyes to see. We are great sinners, but Jesus is a great savior. 
Lord, help us to rejoice in that truth and help us to love you more knowing all that you have done for us in Christ. We pray this in his name, amen. We're gonna sing together number 496. Number 496, my Jesus, I love thee. We will sing all four stanzas and let's stand as we sing. We'll sing uh, 9B, stanza one, as our doxology. Uh, tonight we are back at 6 p.m. We're going to look at uh, Jesus cleansing the temple, one of our favorite Bible stories uh, tonight, and also root beer float night tonight, and so please come back for that. And before we sing the doxology, the Lord uh, pronounces to each one of us the wonderful words of blessing that we hear uh, from the very word of God. And so receive now God's blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>